Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to welcome you here to the Canfield Casino in the Saratoga Springs History Museum and the 2013 Saratoga Springs History Hall of Fame inductions. And this is the final program of the 2013 Alfred Z. Solomon Charitable Trust Program Series. Uh, before we begin, just want to ask if anybody has a cell phone, if you could please silence them um, during the presentation. The Saratoga Springs History Hall of Fame was inaugurated in 2005. Individuals elected to the Saratoga Springs History Hall of Fame are men and women who have made significant and enduring contributions that have enhanced the civic, social, cultural, religious, education, or business life in Saratoga Springs. The museum elects one living and one deceased person annually, and this year we have two worthy individuals. Please allow me to introduce our first inductee, William Collins Whitney. William Collins Whitney was born in Conway, Massachusetts in 1841 and was a descendant from the original Plymouth Colony. He attended Williston Seminary School and then graduated from Yale University in 1863 and from there completed his law degree at Harvard and was admitted to the bar in 1864. On October 13, 1869, Whitney married Flora Payne of Cleveland, Ohio the sister of his classmate and the daughter of wealthy lawyer Harry B. Payne, who eventually ran for president twice and served in both the House and the Senate. Together, they had five children. Whitney became active in politics. He was active in organizing the Young Men's Democratic Club in 1871 and helped bust the tweed ring that ran New York City. In 1872, he was made inspector of schools, but the same year met defeat in the election for DA of New York. From 1875 to 19, or 1882, he was Corporation Counsel of New York. In 1883, he fought for the Broadway Railroad Company franchise with Jacob Sharp and Thomas Fortune Ryan. Sharp initially won the franchise by means of bribery, but in December of 1884, Ryan formed an alliance with Whitney, and they influenced public opinion, instituting court actions, and they defeated Sharp. The Ryan Syndicate finally received the franchise in 1886. Whitney then became Se United States Secretary of the Navy during President Cleveland's first administration in 1885 through 89. He then gave up his own White House aspirations, served as Cle Cleveland's campaign manager in 1892. In his secretary, he did a great deal to modernize the Navy by junking Civil War era wooden ships and invested in modern um, armed steel ships and ar armaments. Whitney joined Charles T. Barney and others forming the New York Loan and Improvement Company in 1890. Whitney joined his brother, Henry, in organizing the Dominion Coal Company of eight, in 1893 and the Iron and Steel Company in 99 to exploit mineral resources. When he announced his intention to retire from active business in 1902, the New York Times described him as the great railroad promoter, a nod to his accomplishment of putting together modern transportation in New York City, which is still with us today. One white writer reviewing his biography called him pretty much the incarnation of America's late 19th century success stories. William Whitney was also a major investor in thoroughbred horse racing and, and, and was internationally known sportsman. He was known for hiring the best trainers, buying the best horses, and engaging the services of the best jockeys of the day. From 1892 until 1900, Saratoga was under the control of a corrupt bookmaker, Gottfried Walbaum. Walbaum had nearly driven the track to ruin, and in 1900, Whitney led a group of investors that acquired Saratoga from Walbaum. Walbaum with the hope for renewal to the glory days of racing. He became president of the, of the association in 1901. Whitney's group kept only 5% of the profits and, re and reinvested the remainder in the track. The group purchased nearby lands, constructed new stands that could seat 6,000 people, the Oklahoma track, stables for owners, and they spared no expense on these improvements. The Traverse Stakes was run for the first time in five years. They brought the track back from the brink of ruin. Essentially, because of William Collins Whitney, the track was reborn. William Collins Whitney died soon after in his Fifth Avenue mansion on February 2nd, 1904, at the age of 62 from a ruptured appendix. He left what the New York Times estimated was a fortune worth $20 million. At his funeral, the pallbearers included his business partner, Thomas F. Ryan, Rover Cleveland, former Secretary of War Eli Root, and J.P. Morgan. Following the service at Grace Church in Lower Manhattan, Whitney's body was taken, uh, taken by a special train from Grand Central Station to be interred in the Whitney Vault at Woodlawn Cemetery in the Bronx. Now I'd like to invite up to the podium and introduce Supervisor Matt Beach, also one of our board members of the History Museum, who is going to introduce our next inductee and our program this evening. Matt. Thanks, Matt. 
Uh, thank you, Jamie. Um, just want to welcome everybody here tonight. Thank you for coming uh, to the uh, to the program. Uh, I also want to uh, welcome all of the Veach uh, family and relatives, and uh, I'm not going to introduce them all because we do have a time limit here tonight, <laughs> and uh, we, we got to uh, get through this program in a certain amount of time. Um, yeah, I mean, it's one of the things that we've been talking about. Jamie and I have had a lot of different conversations as a board member and the director, and, uh, you know, Jamie had mentioned to me that, uh, you know, he was kind of having a little bit of an issue with uh, attendance at these things. So he said, well, let's induct a beach uh, to the Hall of Fame because we'll get 30 people guaranteed to show up. And so uh, we have uh, my dad as the, uh, the honoree tonight. So uh, <laughs> it's uh, one of those things that we do here at the museum. So um, just uh, I want to briefly just give a... a, a background of, of my father and uh, just say a couple of things and then uh, we'll have the program. So um, the, the first thing is just uh, that uh, Michael Beach uh, began his turf writing career with the Saratogian newspaper in 1979 and continues in that capacity with them today. Uh, from 1983 to 1994 he served as the editor of the New York Thoroughbred, a publication of the New York State Breeding and Development Fund devoted to thoroughbred breeding in the state. He served as the New York Breeding Correspondent for the Racing Times from 1991 to 92, and for the Daily Racing Forum from 2005 to 2009. He has written for Thoroughbred Record, The Horseman's Journal, and Backstretch Magazines. Uh, Michael is the author of Foundations of Fame, 19th Century Thoroughbred Racing in Saratoga Springs, published in 2004, and Summit of Champions, Thoroughbred Racing in Saratoga Springs from 1901 to 1955, uh, which was published this year. Uh, he also spent time doing television programs for the OTB network. He is one of the premier turf writers in the nation and is well respected by many within the industry. Uh, Michael is a trustee of the National Museum of Racing and Hall of Fame uh, here in Saratoga and serves as a member of that institution's Hall of Fame nominating committee and historic review committee. He is also a member of the Thoroughbred Division of the Canadian Horse Racing Hall of Fame and, and most recently he was a member of the Saratoga 150 committee uh, that put on the 150th anniversary here in Saratoga Springs. Uh, Michael was born in Saratoga Springs in 1948 and uh, I'll digress here just a bit and just say that uh, you know uh, one of the things that I uh, find just amazing is that you know we live in a world today of people who uh, you know want to get out of their hometown they want to go somewhere else uh, it's all about you know I'm, I'm moving to Colorado or I'm going to Texas or, or we have a job opportunity somewhere and we go there we do all that um, you know, my father actually uh, moved about uh, 500 feet in his life. <laughs> uh, the, the family owned the, the house that was the old Brian Inn up on, uh, uh, on Maple Avenue, and he currently lives on Circular Street just down the hill from the old Brian Inn. So uh, what they say about life and, and having a fulfilling life, uh, it's not always about where you go and, and getting around and seeing the world. I mean, that's all great, and you know, I enjoy traveling myself, but uh, sometimes just uh, moving a few hundred feet is enough. Uh, to get you a fulfilling life in this world, so uh, he's living proof of that. Uh, he was a, a 19. He was born in Saratoga Springs in 1948. Uh, he was a 1966 graduate of Saratoga Springs High School, and a 1970 graduate of SUNY Plattsburgh. Uh, my dad spent his entire professional career as a social studies teacher in the city of Saratoga Springs City School District uh, for I think it was 33 years. Uh, obviously, he lives still in Saratoga Springs on Circular Street. Uh, he's a proud father of five children, myself, uh, my brother Greg, Paul, Mary, and Michael B. Veach. Um, uh, we all are, are involved in public service to some degree in our lives, uh, which is something he's instilled in us. Uh, he also has 12 grandchildren. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, I think we should probably stop the program right now and change who we're honoring, because really the person we should honor is my mother, Gail. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so Dad, just sit right there. Mom, come up to the chair, and we'll we'll, we'll interview you, and you can tell the real story about Michael Beach and uh, his life. So, <laughs> uh, so uh, again, uh, it's a great honor for him, and I'm I'm proud to be here to to, to turn this over and get this started. Uh, and the other thing too, I just wanted to also uh, introduce uh, Charlie Kenzel, who's who is interviewing my father today. And oh yeah, by the way, he's an all-around great guy too. So, um, <laughs> Charlie and, and Mike, come on up and let's uh, do the program. Great introduction. It's funny, um, 
you talked about how this would boost the attendance. Here's my thought. I heard that Mike was going to be inducted and I said, we've got time. If we call DPW and go before design and review, we could put an addition on this room. Because <laughs> I know exactly how many people are going to be here from your family. This is an absolute pleasure for me to be able to spend a few minutes with Mike tonight and uh, highlight his induction into the History Hall of Fame. Mike and I have been good friends for a long time and I totally respect him as a person, a Saratogian, uh, a horse racing enthusiast. And more than once, Gail, we have said, boy, we did okay. Our, our wives always bail us out of things. So I got to tell you, we're both on the same page with that. So Mike, I'm going to start and go through a few things in your life, so buckle up and we'll, <laughs> it won't be that bad, no. First thing, I think there's there's three facets maybe, maybe you, you'll correct me, but there's Mike Veach, the educator, there's Mike Veach, the Saratogian, and Mike Veach, maybe the uh, horse racing enthusiast. So maybe we could put some more, I mean family and everything else is in there too, for sure. But. Um, if I could start with, what was it like to, for you, sure. to grow up here in Saratoga? Well, before I answer that question, I just want to thank everybody for being here tonight. It's, it's very touching to see you, and thank you for taking the time to be with us tonight. And I want to say to Charlie and Dave Patterson, who's part of this thing tonight too, that uh, to have worked with these guys for over three decades professionally was sensational um, and you just showed why you're a master teacher you managed to divide up my life into segments that, that I was not even aware of <laughs> but at any rate uh, to answer your question you know to, to grow up here I mean gosh you know I mean to, to have started at you know Beatrice La Mountain Beach's home and Sydney and my father and all of the beaches there and to be a part of the Blackwood clan some of whom is here today is wonderful an early memory of living up on, you know, 123 Maple Avenue in the corner of High Rock was, uh, my mother and I have talked about this many times, and my mom is here tonight. Um, you know, for those of you of our age, you remember that there was a, a railroad, which is now the Route 50 arterial. And one of the strongest early memories was going out in the backyard and running right up almost to the gate of the train when it was coming along. I mean, that's amazing that it's changed so much. Growing up in Saratoga, the east side recreation field, I mean, um, playing basketball and, and baseball on really endless summer days and in the time when you can go up there without any adult supervision and have pickup games all summer long. After the Little League season ended, which used to end almost in mid-August because we didn't have playoffs, the playoffs were in the cities. So those are very strong memories. Um, you know, ice skating under the lights at the East Side Rec. I hope there's some Winter Club people here. That's a very, very Saratoga thing. I might save the racing memories for later on if you go to that particular place. Um, you know, being downtown and knowing almost everyone that was on the street and, you know, that's, that's not, I don't look back at that and say that I wish that was the way it is now because I think Saratoga Springs is a phenomenal place right now. Um, I'm not in the camp that you know, wants to go back to that. But as my son pointed out, I um, haven't wandered very far. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, those are good memories, yeah. and Saratoga yeah. has always been a really wonderful place. Um, I was going to shift gears a little bit into you as an educator. And I'm going to use that term as an educator. Um, my business partner Dave and I have used this before where we say, a lot of times people would say to us, oh, you're a teacher. And I think eventually you get to a point where you're beyond that. You're an educator, and you're a person that uh, does a lot more than what everybody thinks. And that's the way we think of you. Uh, in fact, let me tell you just a, a real quick thing about education with Mike. Mike taught everybody everything. Um, there was a gentleman in the building who was starting to get involved with racing a little bit. He was starting to learn a few things on racing. And I distinctly remember the time that he came to Mike and he was all upset. It was about January 3rd. And those of you that know something about racing will understand exactly what I'm talking about. He grabbed Mike by the arm and he said, now again, January 3rd. January 3rd. He says, Mike, what happened to all the two-year-olds? <laughs> well, just think about it. They all changed <laughs> one year on January 1st. And... Uh, Mike sat down and explained to him, he got him on the right track. <laughs> he got him back to what a true Saratoga knows. 
<laughs> but see, he educated everybody. <laughs> so, now, um, what kind of things do you remember from your your time as an educator in Saratoga that you'd like to share? Oh about? wow, we couldn't even, you know, we couldn't go any farther forward than something like that. And there's a number of educators in the audience, but you know, I, I think the things that come to mind. I mean. The Saratoga Springs City School District uh, took a chance on hiring a kid fresh out of college, um, you know, 22 years old, and gave him the responsibility of, 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 you know, educating those kids in grade seven and grade eight. I, I, I would speak in broad terms first, you know. They're, they're really, um, I can't think of a better way to go through life than to, than to work with young people. And I must tell you that the young people today, you know, they're getting a bad rap. They, kids try, and they're putting up with a lot. But back to your question, you know, I mean, what a wonderful thing to have as your profession, to be responsible for shaping young minds and to be around their, their vibrancy every day and to actually, as you get older, to really know that you do make a difference. I mean, how many people get the chance to do that in their lives, to actually, you know, and to your left and my right is a master teacher. And, you know, here we are after our career and people are walking up to you and it happens frequently that, oh, Mr. Veach, I hope you remember me. And I do. And it's really beautiful stuff. I mean, can you imagine being given the opportunity to do that with your life? It's really special. It really is. Um, you know, it, it just is. <laughs> what, a, what, a, what a privilege that they would let us do that. And, you know, I mean... I was very hard on my principles, I'm sure, and, you know, Charles knows some of the, you know, stubborn oppositional stance I would take on some things, but, um, you know, those principles were with me, the board was with me, they released me to go work where else at Aqueduct Racetrack for three months. <laughs> you know, seemed like a good idea. You know, <laughs> seemed like a good idea at the time, <laughs> you know, but, you know, um, that's what I think about. I think about those kids who, you know, and they came in. And, you know, when you do this for a living, you just have to start the day with a smile. Because you don't know what's going on in their minds. But if, if they walk into that room and you're smiling, they're going to leave smiling. And I never wanted them to think about Mr. Beach after the bell rang. Well, Mike, we all know that you were phenomenal in the classroom. And really, you, you impacted a lot of people in Saratoga in their lives. So we thank you for that. As you went through your formative years, there must have been a time when all of a sudden the thing you're known for most now, which is racing, kind of all of a sudden started. When did that spark? I know that your, what was your grandfather was with the Racing Hall of Fame and uh, uncle got you on the back stretch, so to yeah. speak. So yeah. when did all this begin for you? Well, I would say without question with the earliest that you can remember at maybe three, four or five years old, my father Don, uh, would take me up to Sylvester Beach's barn each summer. And that was a regular thing. And, you know, for those of you who are in the game, and Charles is, and some of you here, um, you know, if it's in your family, it's enough. If it's not in your family and you go up there and you, you uh, see the barns and you see the horses and you smell the smells and you watch the race, um, it becomes a pretty captivating Saratoga thing that becomes just part of your being. Um, I have very strong memories of going to Sylvester's barn uh, in the, in the mid-50s. Uh, 1955, we'll get to that year later on, but I mean, I can remember, you know, seeing him every morning, going out to the rail with him and, you know, being proud to be there with my father and to meet all the people that would come by. And, you know, for me and for some of you, the, you know, the names Bill Shoemaker and Ed Arcaro and Bobby Ussery and Jim Fitzsimmons and Elliot Birch and Mac Miller, those are, those are, you know, those are hero names. And, you know, I saw these people every morning. And to, to, to become aware of what was going on there was just wonderful. And I, you know, remember getting in great trouble, and I've never told this story until now, and he's not here to stand up for himself. I, my cousin John Beach, who's in Kentucky in the Hall of Fame, and John was a very, very good athlete. And... Um, we got in trouble one day, and for those of you who own horses, you'll get this. We decided to have foot races in the walking ring in front of the barn. <laughs> I yelled that <at> pretty bad. <laughs> so I, 
I didn't lose my credential, <laughs> you know. But those were very strong memories. Um, another thing that uh, some of you younger people might have a lot of fun with is uh, uh, at that time uh, riding your bike, and I'm still riding my bike up to the track, but riding your bike up to the track and you'd go to the Nelson Avenue gate and you know the guard would say, who are you? Why not go into Mr. Beach's bar and let you go in? And I hope there's somebody in this audience who remembers what I'm about to say, but as kids, sometimes alone, we were allowed to walk across the main track in the middle of the afternoon and walk into the infield and settle under a maple tree and watch the steeplechase race. And I don't think anybody's ever going to have that opportunity again. I hope they do. But if there's one um, engraved, burnt in memory, it would have to be doing that for a few summers in the 1950s and early 1960s. But just think of what, what it means to, have, to be able to do that today. That's astounding, and yet we did it. And nobody worried about us because we really didn't know how to behave around the horses. Very good. You know, I was reflecting on tonight, and I thought, what, what a fitting place. Here we are honoring you here tonight. The house that Morrissey built, and then what did he build up the street, the track? And to have you brought in along with William C. Whitney tonight, very fitting. Well, I mean, I don't know. It's possible that we might not be having an observation like this if William C. Whitney didn't come to Saratoga and do what he did. Um, when Jamie was talking about Gottfried Walbaum, that's no exaggeration. There was actually a year where things were so bad we just didn't race. The state, in fact, set aside dates for us to race in 1896, and it was so bad that we didn't. And uh, if it were not for Mr. Whitney purchasing the track as he did, I'm not so sure this all would have carried on. But, you know, to be in this room and to be honored like this is just uh, really, really something. Very deserving. Um, not to bury it with, with a lot of extras, but I'm very interested to hear what your thoughts are on what makes Saratoga track just so different. Because we are different here. Well, we are certainly different, and again, that's something that we could go on and on with all night long, but there are a couple things about the Saratoga track that do stand out for me. I think first, when you travel around in racing, there are very, very few places, and I haven't been to European racing, but in American racing, where at which all of the owners are here for most of the season. Now, that's changed a little bit in the last couple of years, but let's just... We can set that aside, but it, this is where they come for a whole season, and that doesn't happen in too many places, but it does happen in Saratoga, and it's been happening here for, give or take, 150 years. Um, at the upper end, you will not see better racing until you get to the Breeders' Cup when you see what goes on at Saratoga. The beauty of the facilities are remarkable. You cannot help but when you walk around there, and I, I'm very lucky in that my job consists of going and interviewing trainers in the morning and if there's one gift I don't ever want taken away it's to go out in the morning and get a story but when you do this um, I must tell you Charlie that you um, I really believe there's such a thing as the weight of history I, be, I believe that history drips in some places it's dripping in this room but it does drip at Saratoga um, once you learn something about it and once it's got you and it's um, net, uh, you don't really want to leave it. So I think when people come here, they sense that. And when, and if you're really into thoroughbred racing, and you, you know, think about Secretariat and Man of War and, and Buck Passer and you know Kentucky and Hanover and Hamburg and on and on it goes, and it suddenly hits you that wow, you know, they were here and they were here because their people wanted them to be here. And then when you think about one of the greatest names of any century, Lexington, which maybe doesn't hit some of you between the eyes, but he's an apocal sire in, in, the, in the 19th century. And to think that in 1854, when there was a break of racing on Long Island, his owners brought him to Saratoga for refreshments. No racing here. They just brought him up here because it was a thing to do. That's amazing really is. Well, you started and you ran through some names. I'm going to ask a question that I think probably a lot of you may want to ask Mike tonight, which is, he brought it up, well, who's the greatest horse? 
Yeah, you can only get to pick I one. I don't get five. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, okay. Um, I, 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 I guess I, I would have to say, if I were pushed to the wall, the thoroughbred that I thought possibly is the, the, the best American bread and the most gifted runner that I ever saw, and don't, don't throw tomatoes at me, um, would be Ruffian. Um, I, 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 yeah. Um, I mean, we'll get, never know. Do you get that question a lot? I do. I do get that question a lot. Yeah, I, I do, and I do answer it that way. And I would put, of course, secretariats, things that I've seen in person, Seattle Slough, you know, definitely. But um, to have seen Ruffian in person, um, I, I think there's a few people here who might have, and I, I think she was. You know, had she not broken down, who knows what would have happened? She was just a, a truly amazing. You know. I, 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 let me, let me, hold on. <laughs> Keep going. Another way that I answer the question is, um, uh, if I could stage a dream race and I could take, pick any number, fifty or a hundred of them. So if I say a hundred, you've all got your favorite horse in there. Um, I, if I could have them over a, a big open field and it was maybe two or three or four miles straight and we could all start them equally together side by side, uh, the way I would say, who, who, how would that race turn out? What I would say is that the horse that would be in front until she broke down would be Ruffian and the last horse of the hundred that would be left standing when everybody else was finally exhausted, I would say would be Seattle Slough. I thought Slew would come into this. One. <laughs> yeah, I, I know Mike's had an affinity for Seattle Slew for <laughs> more than once. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, this brings since you brought up the field of dreams, so to speak. Oh, okay. here, Yeah. Greatest race ever. In person, Jiper Rydan, the Travers here. Uh, well, I guess it would have to be in person. Um, that was sixty-two, right? Sixty-two Travers here. Um, I, I'd like to get the year. There's a couple people here who, who know this. When uh, Slew and Affirm met in the, in the Jockey Club Gold Cup that um, Exceller won, um, that would be another unbelievable race to have seen in person. I was there that day, yeah. Very good. I know I've seen the film on, on the 62 Traveler. Oh, and it, not believable. Like I say, it's almost like an Ali yeah, Frazier film. Exactly, fight. yeah. Exactly. Right to the yeah, end. Yeah, it's a great one. Unbelievable. Well, you're sharing tonight with William C. Whitney, and we know that he did a lot for the Oklahoma track. What do you see the impact of Oklahoma is on Saratoga as a city? Well, I've often said that, um, you know, one of the most important events, one of the seminal events in the post-World War II era um, would be the decision by the New York Racing Association in late 1979 to decide to open the Oklahoma training track for off-season training. It was so used prior to the war, but this was a new development in the um, 1980, and um, its impact has really been phenomenal. Uh, I won't digress into the reasons that they did it, but um, and it had a couple of interruptions, and there's a couple of folks right in this audience who worked very hard to keep it alive when it was in trouble in the mid-1980s, and I think they should be recognized as Joe Dalton and Joe McMahon, amongst others, who did very, very tremendous work in, in ensuring that this because they saw early on what the Oklahoma meant. Today we have a seven month training facility and I think that the thing that people need to know about the Oklahoma is that because of its existence now as part of the franchise agreement that owners and trainers have bought homes in Saratoga and I've often believed in my heart that part of the surge in the 1980s into the mid 90s was the fact that racing people bought real estate in Saratoga because they wanted to be here to see their horses in the off season. And that was simply not a part of our community until this happened. It, it started with some hiccups, but now it's, uh, it's the real deal. And um, it's, it's, you know, countless Breeders' Cup winners and et cetera, and major winners have trained here because these folks just want to be here. It's a huge impact. Yeah, very good. Um... That brings up, I mean, the fact that uh, Oklahoma just closed, what was it, last, last Friday? Last Friday was the last day of training, yeah. Yeah. Um, should the meet be longer? No. Um, I don't, you know, I, I don't mind being put on the griddle about that. Um, I feel pretty strongly that we, we're, we're maybe a little farther than, uh, longer than we should be. 
Um, I understand what it means for people in the business. I truly do. I understand that purses are very good, but speaking only for myself, I've seen things change in the last 10 to 15 years. Um, there, there are some endless days at Saratoga. I'm not happy with racing at 7 o'clock at night. And um, I've used this statistic in a couple of my columns. And I, and I know that it's harsh, but um, our high water mark was 2003. And we were averaging 29,000 a day for that 36 day meet. This year at 40, we averaged 22 for a 40 day meet. Um, and that decline has not been just a blip, it has continued from 2003 to 2013. And I think we have to pay attention and remember that Saratoga is at its best as a, as a, as a high quality summer resort boutique meet that offers the best in racing. Uh, I am not saying that there should not be, you know, I don't know what the perfect number is, but for me, 40 is too long. I think there's a lot of weariness. And again, going out in the morning, I sense it with the people who make a living here that um, it's, it's too long. I believe it's too long. Good point. Well, that brings me to another one. And I'm not trying to open I'm, up everything I'm, here. I'm you. here and I'm fair game for <laughs> people who are here. He's great, isn't he? <laughs> Um, as we all know in the room, uh, the last election, uh, recent election, brought up the whole idea of casinos in upstate New mm -hmm. York, etc. Um, if a casino was built here, I, you know, I'm asking you to be a, you know, a, a viewer of the future, so to speak. Uh, and if you can do this, you can also give me the numbers for tomorrow's lotto or something. <laughs> <laughs> but, but on a more more positive note, I, how do you see if if we get casinos into that mix, what's your thought on its impact on thoroughbred racing? Well, I'd like to answer that by uh, addressing what, what is on my mind before and until and perhaps if we don't get to that point. Um, a couple of full disclosures. I um, advocated for the Racino at Saratoga Raceway. I believe that the way the 2002 legislation which permitted it was written was correct. I believe that having local referendum was correct. And I, and I was pretty sure that if that happened, what it would do for people who make a living at the, race, at the raceway. And I believe a very good piece of property was saved. Um, having said that, full disclosure number two, as a member of uh, Concerned Citizens of Saratoga Racing last December, we met um, at the chamber offices and um, we, we endorse the concept if, if the casino amendment passes that we would want Saratoga to pay, take part in it because we felt that it would be better off here than somewhere else. So now that the disclosures are out of the way, um, I was very unhappy when the amendment language came out. And I don't feel that if you birth something the way this was birthed. I don't have a good feeling about casinos going forward in Saratoga Springs when something starts the way this started. And I think it's very, very important for people to pay attention to the way the citizens of Saratoga Springs and Saratoga County voted on this. In the larger perspective, um, the city that everybody here loves, Saratoga Springs is an incredible place right now. It's vibrant, it's hopping, it's alive. We're doing this on a Wednesday night in mid-December, November. You could go downtown and find the restaurants full. Many of us in this room remember when that was not the case. Uh, many of us in this room remember when it was a day of racing. If you went downtown on Broadway, you could pretty much walk down the middle of the street and see 10 cars and that'd be about it. Now there's more people downtown than are at the track some days. I think Saratoga is an incredible place right now. I think it's, I really, really do. So that makes me wonder, does a casino upset that balance? I don't have an answer to that. But I, do, I will answer your question by saying that I, I'm not afraid to tell you that I did not like that language and that amendment being changed and the way that was handled by the system. So if something starts that way, I have a worry about it. And I believe that when I wrote my column about it and I felt I needed to do that was that um, the question I left with myself was, does the end justify the means? And I still feel that way right now. If this happens, uh, there's an awful lot of work that has to be done. So right now, I'm, I'm a negative on it. Well, thank you. I, I do appreciate you 
put yourself out and, it's okay. and answering the question because yeah. I, I think that was I know that was been on my mind. In oh, terms of, how can that be on our mind? Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I've got to tell you a little side note. Uh, Mike and I share the, the same uh, undergraduate college, uh, SUNY Plattsburgh, yeah. and uh, Mike actually changed the life in Plattsburgh, New York, concerning racing. Let me see if I can bring this back to you, okay? Because I, I want to see, have you see what, what a total package Mike was. M Mike went into a newsroom in Plattsburgh, New York, with undisclosed date, we won't get into that, and asked for the daily racing form. A glazed look came over the clerk's face, in which time he inquired, no, I, I don't think we, what's, what's it called again, type thing? Mike repeated it. He said, no, no, Mike, Mike in, in, he went a little further. He said, why don't you carry it? And they said, well, we have to have three people wanting it in order to order it. <laughs> so Mike, what did you do to facilitate that in Plattsburgh, New York? This is all true. And, and <laughs> I actually told the guy that if he'd get the three, I'd buy the three every day. <laughs> and has absolutely changed the North Country <laughs> to this day. Here it is 40 years later. <laughs> oh my goodness. True story. Yeah. One I've always loved. True story. <laughs> and yes, I did run pools at Gus Rappas' bar at the Old Crest Lounge. <laughs> <laughs> and who was it that used to send you the racing forms all bundled oh, up? Oh, bless him. Um, the late Bud Mulholland on yeah. the West Side. Uh, he would save me his forms. And when I came home for vacation breaks, I'd go back with boxes of old racing forms. And, you know, that's true. That's really true. See, As see. it is true, the kids used to read my form during study hall. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brother. Well, as we get near the end of our no. conversations tonight, what kind of reflections or, or comments do you want to make instead of a, answering a question from me? Is there anything in terms of... The, the evening, racing, city of Saratoga that you'd like to comment on before we open it up to questions from the audience? Well, I'm glad we're doing that. Um, I, I just really want to say that, you know, I'm really humbled by this whole thing. I don't do what I do to be up here. And um, that you would be here tonight with me is very, very special. And my family's here, and I'm going to cry now. <laughs> I promised I wouldn't. And it's wonderful that they're here for this and to have you as a friend, and, and you know. Um, it's just all very special, but David Morris is back here, and <laughs> David, I'm so happy to see you. Thank you for all you taught me about racing. He commissioned me to do a study on Thorbid racing at his track, and I learned more working for David Morris for about a year and a half for him sending me all over the state uh, than I did even working for the Breeders' Cup. And I'm so proud that he's here tonight, and you should understand what he's done for Saratoga. Um, if I talk about the kids, I'll really cry. Okay, understand, understand. Well, um, Jamie, uh, can you help us with, I was going to open everything up for questions now in terms of, uh, do you want to use this mic or the, the wireless probably? Yeah, and I'll switch with you, Mike. How's that? Anybody with questions? Joe. Just uh, a comment. Uh, Mike had mentioned training and Joe McMahon and myself. I think everybody should understand is Mike is the one who started that all by dragging us down to act up in a dining room with 3,000 people and 23 of us and 29,000 or you know, whatever. We were the only people in a dining room. Yeah. <laughs> and they came up pleasantly and said, uh, Oh, by the way, this is the official's memoir, Ray, because Mike said, let's go down and show the flag of Saratoga. So we went down, and they came up to us at lunch and said, oh, by the way, we're having a press conference this afternoon saying we're not going to run racing in the future at Saratoga. Mm -hmm. And Mike just said, wait a minute, hold it, don't make any press announcements or anything, give us some time. And on our way back, Mike took the lead and put together a team that safe training for Saratoga, so uh, he mentions other people, he doesn't mention himself. You didn't have to say that, John. <laughs> I want my 10 bucks later. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do remember paying for a 
want to dequestra, so. <laughs> Thank questions? you, thank you, Joe. Yes. Uh, Mike, you started writing for the Saratogian in the late 70s. Yes. The last time we had a Triple Crown winner was in the late 70s. Is that a coincidence? <laughs> <laughs> and do you think, why do you, why do you think like, we haven't had one since? That's scary. The last one was 1978, but, um, gosh. Bigger minds than mine have spent a lot of time wondering about why there hasn't been a Triple Crown winner. I, I'm, I don't know that I'm in the camp of people who believes that horses are less sound than they used to be. Uh, they may be being raised a little differently than they used to be. Um, we've had an awful lot of near misses that could have been hit, some of them by less than a length. Um, I just think the right horse has to come along at the right time. I will say one thing though that um, that it, the statistics bear this out, but it's hard, it's hard to believe that the statistics are what they are. For, for some reason, um, the, the very, very light racing schedule that two-year-olds have um, has not translated into good form at three. And there's that old Breeders' Cup jinx thing about how only one of them in 30 years has gone on to win the Derby. I don't know why that is. Um, I did a piece in the midsummer before Saratoga, and I just randomly picked the year 1960 about two-year-old racing. And um, Joe's of my generation, he remembers this. But you know, David, there were year after year horses that came to Saratoga, many of them had won three or four stakes races before they came to Saratoga. Not three or four starts. And you know, half a dozen horses in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile, it was their third lifetime start. For some reason, this isn't carrying on to good form at three. I don't know why. I don't, I don't, I'm not into that bit that we've all of a sudden bred a weaker horse. Dr. Jim Prendergast said to me, and I've never forgot it, that he said, you know, do you really think that three or four centuries of breeding can be reversed in a generation or two? And that pretty much stopped me in my tracks on that. So, um, but man, there's some brilliant people in racing that haven't got that one done. Um, it's a great question. It's a real good question. Oh. Now the tough ones start. <laughs> I'll identify this questioner as Sergeant Paul Beach. <laughs> Two part. Okay. Two part. Okay. First, as a former student, believe it or not, I was his student. I believe I got an 85 um, in one of the quarters. I was just wondering how that could possibly be justified with my <laughs> stellar academic career. <laughs> I, that's probably best in my, in my, my case. Uh, part two, uh, your favorite son currently holding a microphone. <laughs> <Okay>. Next. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. We're, we're very proud of you and we love you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much. Gregory. I want to say it was mostly Paul's fault <laughs> that when he jumped out of the window and left tracks, because you taught us to be so close, it was I that, that uh, uh, erased the track so that you guys wouldn't know it's what out happened. Now. I, I know you guys have been wondering about that for at least 25 <laughs> okay. years. I, well, listen, you left your own. somebody had to take the ball for this. Go ahead. We are, of course, we are all very proud of you. Thank you, Greg. I actually did have a serious question. I realize I yes. can ask this anytime I want, but uh, I figured I'd ask it now. And uh, Maybe you could talk just a little bit about the Veach family history in racing. Uh, Sil, Sid, Leo, and maybe explain why you are not a trainer or involved in... Uh, you know, actually hands-on working with the horses? That's a question I, I guess I've never asked and I would kind of like to know. Great-grandfather Silas Beach came here at least as early as 1892. And he was born in Canada and is an extremely noted trainer. And as a matter of fact, um, just so you all know, uh, he's actually under consideration for the Canadian Horse Racing Hall of Fame right now. They've asked me to do some research on him and uh, he was a very, very talented horseman. 
his four sons are Sydney and his daughter Ethel. His four sons are Sydney, Tommy, Leo, and um, and Sylvester. And Sydney is my grandfather, and Sydney is my father Don. And I've been asked Gregory's questions many, many times, and I will do not mind telling you that the business of training thoroughbreds is a gypsy life. It's very, very hard. And uh, when I met my wife in high school, um, I really did want to have a family. And um, I didn't think I could do both. And uh, a lot of people in racing struggle with that a great deal. Um, the opportunities were there, but I never really seriously considered it. I worked at the barn one summer. But, um, you know, my what matters most to me is here tonight. So that's why I didn't go in it. But it's nice that I've been given the opportunity to uh, stay in the game in some fashion. It's been very wonderful. It really has been. Other questions? No, except that that beach generation thinks that they started that stuff. <laughs> Somebody else, please. Feel, feel, feel free. <laughs> Mike, yeah. you mentioned the word Canada a couple times. Oh, yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what your interest is in Canadian racing and what, you, what you've seen of Canadian racing over the years? Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's been an honor for them to invite me to their various committees. And um, uh, Gail and I started going to Woodbine in 1990, and one of the reasons I wanted to go up there as well as CO Blue Bonnets was to actually see where the beaches worked at the time. There were a lot of tracks in the St. Lawrence Valley. So it, it kind of started there and subsequently I've come to um, appreciate a great deal what the Woodbine Racing Community does as far as the thoroughbreds go. And after all, I mean on just even a, on, a, on, a, on a, you know, a plain level, um, you know, Northern Dancer might have been the sire of the 20th century and he was Canadian. So you have to be attracted for that as long. Joe himself has experience with a number of those stallions. And um, I just think that, you know, we tend on this side of the border to kind of, I wouldn't say be ignorant of, but not pay enough attention to what goes on up there. And uh, it's, it's a really, really wonderful racing facility. And for those of you who are fans, if you, ever get the chance to go to Woodbine on a Queen's Plate day or an international day or Woodbine Mile day, I recommend it because I think you'll be uh, uh, heartened to find out that there's another place that cares as much as they do about it. Um, so that's how I would answer your question. It, it's always a joy. That's where Gail and I race vacation. We do go to there for that. It's, uh, it's pretty special. Phenomenal turf course and all that sort of thing. Anyone else? As we come to a conclusion of our uh, program for tonight, I think it's very fitting. I would like to applaud for this gentleman who has done so much for Saratoga and racing right now. Mike, congratulations. <laughs> all for coming and I know Mike will have a hard time getting to the door so there'll be a lot of questions between now and then so 